I have officially clicked record and good morning and welcome to life. Thank you so much for joining us for this little hour of learning on all sorts of different things. This morning we are going to be learning about how to make our own masks and some of the reasons why we wear masks and that sort of thing with and also a study that was conducted kind of in house by some of the librarians, so to speak. So. Today we have with us three of the librarians who are part of this project, which is what we're calling mask making librarians, which are Regina Ritolo, Bronwyn Sutherland, and Tracy Williams. And I believe they have all different levels of sewing skills and you know, craft and creative skills. So kind of gonna help out those of us who are a little craft impaired, I think. I know that I have tried to make my own masks and it has been a real adventure, so I'm looking forward to learning how to do it right and proper. So if you would like, guys, to go on ahead and get started and give us the download on how to make our own masks. I know yes. it can be very expensive to purchase them. Right. So our, our program may be a little different than what you're expecting, um, but Rachel is correct. Uh, we are going to show you how to make some masks at the end of our presentation. Um, but the idea for the mask making librarians came, came around in late April. We had already been working from home for over a month and uh, Tracy started a, a text thread uh, between, well, the three of us because we were all sewing masks for our friends and our family. So we decided, hey, this would be a great project to collect some data on and then further down the road, uh, give a presentation. So keep in mind as uh, we go through the presentation, a lot of the research and the ideas and the data we collected for this, um, we're in development almost four months back now, almost five months back. So keep that in mind as we go through it and when we get to the data that we collected. Um, but I hope if you are joining us today that, um, you will enjoy our presentation and I'm going to go ahead and get started. I can change the slide here and then of course we just all have our bios here and this is for the presentation that we will have available later on the uh, life web page. But our presentation outline is here just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, you already met all of us and we discussed the origins of the product, uh, project. And now I'm going to go into a little bit of the, the history uh, of masks and wearing masks in a, during a pandemic. And I'm most, mostly focusing on in the United States for this part. And then once I discuss the history, I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Bronwyn and she's going to go over COVID-19 in our current situation. And then um, we're going to turn the floor over to Tracy and she's going to discuss some of the public opinion and the data that we collected with one of our surveys back in May, and then she'll touch on some other um, important mask wearing information. And then at the end of our presentation, we are going to uh, discuss our mask making process and give you some helpful links and recommendations. Okay, so let's get started in uh, with an interactive um, part of our presentation. If you are able, please type yes in the chat box if you have already made your own mask or you've tried one of those DIY mask projects you've seen online or on social media. And just to let you know, we are going to collect the chat transcript and use this data for um, something we may post on our website or on social media in the future. So type yes in the chat box if you've made your own mask. I'll give you all a moment to do that and I'm going to go ahead and move on. Again, touching on the uh, giving some context to our current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what you see here on the screen is a picture of suffragists standing in front of the White House in 1918 in the middle of the pandemic. And what is, what is the main thing that you notice? What stands out? besides the banners. For me, what stood out was the fact that none of these suffragists were wearing 
face masks or face coverings. So these women were all congregated together, uh, picketing for the right to vote, protesting for the right to vote in front of the White House, and none of them had masks. And there is a pandemic ravaging the country. And um, in one of one of the newspaper articles I was reading for my research, I came across a quote that said, everything conspires against women's suffrage. Now it is the influenza. So long story short, World War I and the influenza ended up galvanizing this, the suffragist movement. So, so that was a good thing, but suffragists were not keen on wearing masks. Masks were akin to muzzles for them. They wanted to be recognized. They wanted to be prominent figures in this fight for the vote. And um, it, took, it took the incapacitation of famous suffragist Carrie Chapman Catt being uh, bedridden with the flu for her to send out letters to all the suffragists and say, hey, we may need to put a pause on our social gatherings and in our organizing uh, so we're not all taken out by the flu. Now, you'll notice here on, uh, on the right-hand side, the political cartoon about the Sedition Act, this was something else that was going on in the background of America right now. President Wilson had entered America into the World War I in 1917, and he was absolutely obsessed with the war, and he was obsessed with America's image and the image of his administration. Um, because of this, there was something called the Sedition Act that was uh, instated. And long story short, President Wilson was busy coming up with the, with the legislation for the Sedition Act to censor the press and to hold people accountable for saying anything um, that would cast the American government in a bad light. He was busy working on, on legislation for this instead of supporting women's right to vote and looking at the legislation for the 19th Amendment. So ultimately this, this gag, uh, gag rule, uh, the Sedition Act, prohibited the press from painting America in a bad light. The other side of this is Wilson didn't want information shared with, with the press and with our country about the, the flu pandemic. Flu pandemic was killing uh, thousands of people and Wilson did not want this uh, written about in the press. So ultimately the flu pandemic in the United States as uh, it was here at the beginning of the pandemic was downplayed and a lot of the information was censored and people uh, did not know that the necessity for a mask was to save their lives and to uh, stop the spread of the, of the flu. So um, take away, uh, key takeaways from this slide is that we had uh, our own social and political unrest going on in America while there was the world war on the global stage and President Wilson didn't want information about the flu pandemic to get out. So uh, the flu pandemic here in the United States became known as the Spanish flu or the Spanish influenza because Spain did not have a censored press. They were not at war at this time and they had already been uh, stricken by the pandemic and they were freely writing about it. So American citizens were finding out information from the Spanish press about the influenza pandemic that was ravaging their own country. Moving on, I need to keep track of time. Oh. So I think I accidentally clicked on one of the links here. Give me one moment. And everything, all of the images here are linked so you can go and um, research what we're discussing here on your own. So next slide. So, of course, as is, as is the tradition with, with women, they always show up when there's a war to pick up the slack when the men have to go to war and to help aid the war effort in any way that they can. So during World War I, we had Thousands of nurses join the Red Cross and train on how to treat uh, patients with, uh, with the influenza. 
So they were treating soldiers and soldiers were were stricken with influenza um, while they were staying in their army barracks. Uh, Historian John Barry hypothesizes that the flu pandemic of 1918 originated in army barracks in Kansas. Um, In later interviews, he backtracked that saying that, well, maybe it originated in China. But he does, uh, John Barry does stress that the war played a huge factor in spreading the the influenza of 1918 because you had so many soldiers traveling, carrying it to to family, to friends, and staying in these small uh, quarters, these army barracks, and and, um, spreading the disease. Nobody was wearing masks or even thinking about how the the disease was being spread. So you had Red Cross nurses jump jump up and go to their sewing machines and they started creating masks for soldiers and really they were creating masks for um, all the doctors and nurses that were working with the soldiers and they were also creating masks to give out to the public. Well, once the Red Cross ran out of their own supplies for masks for soldiers in the public, they decided they went and they printed an article. And uh, in my research, I came across an article where you can see here on the top left screen, Red Cross tells how to make masks at home. So you can see all of the DIY instructions for making your own mask at home um, from 1918 here. And the materials they used were layers of muslin or cheesecloth. And in the newspapers and in diaries, the masks are often referred to as these onerous, strange raviolis that you have to plaster on your face with several layers of cheesecloth. So people didn't like these masks. They did not like wearing them at all, but they, you know, after seeing so many people around them drop dead from the flu, they realized it was a necessity. So they were willing to to stick out the discomfort and wear a mask. And then you can see here on the right hand side, this is from the the National uh, (coughs) Medical Museum. And there is a Red Cross nurse showing how to properly wear a mask to prevent influenza. Moving on here, and this this is a fascinating photograph. Um, obviously, it's been digitally remastered, and it is from the National Archives, but it shows how serious people took their mask wearing. Now, uh, during this time, you had a lot of Western uh, states requiring um, mask mandates. They were they were mandating that people wear masks out in public, and they were closing establishments. They were taking the social distancing policy seriously. And you can see how strongly some people felt here because uh, the, the person uh, standing on, on my right is wearing a sign on their trench coat, wear a mask or go to jail. So a couple of questions here, like was mask wearing effective in 1918? Yes and no. It did help flatten the curve and stall the, the spread of the influenza but it really depended on how people were wearing their masks and the materials the masks were made of. So um, we had cities like Seattle, San Francisco, other Western uh, states enforcing um, mask wearing with jail time and fines. So you could, if you went out in public and you didn't have a mask, it was very likely that you would be fined or stopped by a police officer. Um, so that's something to consider. Today, when we go outside, if we're not wearing a mask in public, do we expect to be stopped by an officer or get a fine? And it was it was it was strictly enforced in 1918. And it's interesting to compare how um, how we're handling it now out in public. Now, one of the things I do want to to bring up, I'll move on to the next slide here. Uh, This is one of my favorite slides because you see that people were masking up their pets in 1918. On uh, on one side of the screen, you can see a cat and a dog, or maybe two cats with face coverings on. And in the other photo, you can see the gentleman holding what looks to be like a tabby cat with a face covering on. Now, I want to note, it's important to note that the American Veterinarian Medical Association does not recommend masking up your pet. Uh, but I will say that I went to the vet last week and there was a person with a bulldog in their car and the bulldog was wearing an N95 mask. 
and it was hilarious. But so it was it's not unsafe, but uh, the Veterinarian Medical Association does not recommend masking up your pets. But I love these photos and stumbling across these um, during my research because it shows how people how much people loved their pets and they considered them a part of the family. So of course, if if their kid had to mask up or their husband had to mask up, they were gonna mask up their beloved uh, fur baby. Um, I, and one other thing to note, I know I'm running over my time here, is that um, people were wearing masks in public and there is video footage of this in newspaper accounts. And they were, they would often have um, there would be a man wearing a mask, but the woman wouldn't be wearing a mask, or a woman would be wearing a mask, or th and the man wouldn't be wearing a mask. And there would be people wearing their masks out in public, but as soon as they entered an establishment, they would remove their masks, which completely defeated the purpose of wearing masks. So we see that the masks were effective when people were wearing them properly and, fought and in um, conjunction with social distancing rules, but if people were taking off their masks as soon as they walked into an establishment, then it defeats the purpose. You're safer outside, even without a mask, than you are inside without wearing a mask. And as you can see here on the screen, we have an officer who has stopped a couple, and he is telling the, the woman that, hey, it's required for you to be wearing a mask. And I assume he's saying, if your beau here is wearing a mask, and if I can wear this mask on my face, then you should be wearing a mask too. Um, I can only guess why she didn't wear a mask. Um, it could be vanity, who knows, she, maybe she didn't have a mask. But on the other side here, you see the anti-mask beating. So in 1918, uh, just as now, there were, there were culture wars and mask wars going on. People did not like being told that they had to wear a mask or risk jail time. They felt like their civil liberties were being infringed upon. So this prompted uh, people across the country to start what is called anti-mask leagues. And they would post ads in the paper saying, hey, we're gonna meet up and discuss, you know, how we're, gonna, um, how we're gonna get out of this, how we're going to petition the government. And this is, you know, this is un-American. So you did see a lot of these anti-mask leagues popping up, but I think the um, more broadly, people were on board with wearing masks and doing whatever they needed to, to prevent the spread of influenza. Because as I said, they were seeing friends and family drop like flies around them and they wanted to do anything they could to, to mitigate that. Now this is a fun find I came across during my research. Um, we are all familiar with the term snake oil and this particular uh, concoction was created in Beeville, Texas by a, a Jones Medicine Company. And this concoction was used to treat all kinds of ailments. It was really a cure all. And because there wasn't a lot of research at the time about the flu and what it was and how it made people sick or how it was treated outside of the uh, social distancing and mask measures we could take, um, you can imagine that people profiteered off this, especially people who were in the quote unquote snake oil business. So that was something fun that I found in the, in the archives there. And uh, last but not least, the main thing that we can pull from, key points we can pull from the looking at the flu pandemic of 1918, reflecting on that and thinking about what we're experiencing today is that the, the free flow of information is imperative to, um, to, to mitigate a national crisis such as a pandemic. So in 1918, we saw that the press was censored, that Wilson wanted to keep up appearances, so people didn't realize how deadly the flu was and the necessity for social distancing and masks until thousands of people had already died. So here we see the Red Cross, they are set up with their masks. You can see the different types of masks. The gentleman standing behind the information center has a mask that comes out. I, I guess it makes it easier to breathe, uh, breathe but I'm excited to be uh, part of um, part of this. As librarians, it is you know it's what we do. We provide access to information, and we believe in the free flow of information. And that's what you see these doctors and nurses at the Red Cross providing for people coming up, asking about the flu and asking about masks. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's important to stay up to date on the research. 
and to read from various sources and uh, especially concerning today's COVID-19 outbreak. And I know Bronwyn's gonna dive into that in her part of the presentation. Another question before we move on to Bronwyn's section, if you will type this, your answer in the chat box, did you know about the influenza pandemic of 19 prior to COVID-19? And remember the influenza pandemic of 19 was also referred to as the Spanish flu. So if you knew about it before this year, go ahead and let us know in the chat box. And if the chat box isn't working for people, then that's okay. We're gonna move on. Okay, now we're, we're over to Tracy and Tracy is going to cue me when to move her slides. Oh, sorry, it's me. Oh, I'm sorry to Bronwyn. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we know, you know, in the scientific literature, what's been shown about COVID-19 and some recent uh, developments um, that have occurred. So, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, Regina. Okay, so this is kind of a, a new thing that this study was published a few weeks ago. Monica Gandhi and um, George Rutherford, who you see there on the screen, they're two epidemiologists who uh, are out of University of California, San Francisco, and they're some of the leading uh, experts in this area. Um, so they recently published, um, it's not a study, it's just kind of a comment on all the studies that have been done, it's commentary. But basically what they're saying is that wearing a mask um, may be just, you know, maybe as effective as actually getting a, vac a vaccine, as crazy as that sounds. Um, but it can help get wearing a mask can help uh, spread immunity um, by improving the chances that if you do contract COVID, that it's a mild or whoops. Oh, can you go back just for a second? Sorry. Yeah, that it's a mild or a symptomatic case. So basically what scientists think now about COVID is that the severity of your symptoms is positively correlated with the um, amount of particle that you're exposed to. So those little droplets, the viral particles. So if you're exposed to more particle, that means that your symptoms could be worse. And there are probably other factors, but that's what they what they think now. So being if you're wearing a mask and you're exposed to somebody who ha who is um, infected with COVID, um, if you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask, then you, uh, you might be exposed, but you might be exposed to just a tiny bit of that virus, which would then, lead to what we call variolation, which is basically, you know, you're, you've been exposed to a small bit of it, just like in a vaccine, so your body will create um, antibodies to that vaccine, thereby resulting in you being immune. Okay, so uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so right after, pretty soon after uh, those two scientists came out with, uh, wrote that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most respected journal, uh, journals in the medical field, by the way, um, so the director of the CDC, Robert Redfield, came out and said, made this announcement, said, wearing this mask is probably more helpful at this point than even a vaccine. Because if you get a vaccine, you know, that vaccine might not, it's a 70% chance, more or less, that that vaccine will um, result in your body creating antibodies to the, va uh, the virus. Just because you get a vaccine doesn't mean that that's a 100% guarantee that you're going to be immune. So he, what he's saying is that wearing a mask right now is even more effective because, you know, if I get the vaccine and I, my body doesn't create that immune response, wearing the mask might help me do that. Um, so the face mask might be more, even more protective than a vaccine at this point. So that's a pretty strong statement that he made. Um, okay, so next slide. Okay, so what we know, uh, those, those are the latest developments. Uh, what we know about COVID is that it is spread via respiratory droplets. Probably most of you know this, um, you know, and the closer you are to that person, if they're talking in your face or they're, you know, they cough around you, the closer you are, the more likely you are to, you know, to get the viral particles in your face and, you know, and inhale them or whatever. Um, the tricky thing about COVID, which is different, and I'm, you may, I'm sorry, I apologize for telling you, things that you already know. But the tricky thing about this virus, uh, how it's different from the first SARS virus, is that, um, excuse me, it's my phone, 
people who are asymptomatic, they've, they've shown have as much or even more viral load uh, than somebody who's symptomatic. So that makes it very tricky to control this virus. Um, so in order to, uh, it's harder to control, it spreads more easily for that reason. So to prevent uh, the spread, we obviously need distancing and we need some kind of physical barrier in the form of a mask so that if somebody is talking to you, you know, and they happen to be asymptomatic, but, you know, they, they're carrying the virus, then you don't, um, you know, you, you don't, your chances of uh, taking in a, a big viral load of that part, virus particle is less likely. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so what they found also, they found out, uh, I'm going to talk about a study that was done at Duke University. They've, they've tested a bunch of different kinds of masks, and they found that some masks definitely work better than others when it comes to um, preventing uh, this, you know, this physical barrier, preventing transmission. Um, so N95, the N95 mask is the top. It's the best mask, um, and that's followed by the surgical mask. And then... Um, after that, you have cotton, you know, dual layer cotton and poly with a pro polypropylene layer in between. Um, so that's like number three. Um, the least effective masks are the gator masks, um, the ones that kind of hang down, you know, off the, off the face. And I'm guessing that's just because it's so open. There's probably a lot of potential, you know, for, for virus to, to, you know, come out of that under, under that opening. Um, and then also a, a single layer mask. Um, obviously, just you know that's logical. There, you only have a single barrier between you and, and the virus. So, um, so those are the least effective. Obviously, face shields without a mask are ineffective. A face shield is just really designed just to added protection, but especially for the eyes because you know they think that COVID, you know if you get COVID or you touch a surface and you touch your eye or you could possibly get vir viral particle in the eye. Um, but I've seen some people uh, wearing those without a mask and that's completely ineffective. So um, that's really not a good way to go about it. Um, so, and if the next slide then, thank you, Regina. Okay, so here's what they found. This is a study that was done, uh, like I said, at Duke um, University. And so you can see there, they've tested all these different kinds of masks. And like I said, the top one is that N95 fitted, not with a valve. I've seen some people wearing those N95s with valves, and um, those are not effective. You're still, you're exhaling. If you are infected with COVID-19, you're exhaling viral particle and also could be inhaling um, into your mask. So that's not good. I've seen a few of those around as, as well. Because as you can see, uh, the, D, the N95 is top, then we've got surgical, then we've got a combination of cotton and, and polypropylene fabric. Um, and then it looks like the two-layer cotton pleated mask is slightly more effective than an Olsen style mask. The Olsen style masks are the ones that are just like not pleated, you know, and that, that's the kind that I wear. But it, there's not a huge uh, difference between the two. Um, but as you go down the list, you can see a single layer pleated is less effective. Um, then, uh, and then you come down knitted, a bandana, scarf, all of those are the least effective and a net gator is dead, dead last. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just one last word about misinformation. There is a lot of misinformation out there about COVID. Um, so, you know, we, we have a method we, we like to call SIFT, which is um, a, just a way to, you know, help you weed out uh, the wheat from the chaff, you know, when it comes to all this information. So just make sure there's there are a lot of claims made and, um, you know, you always have to trace, even if you agree with that claim, you have to trace it back and make sure that it's coming from somewhere that's reputable. You know, like, so when I saw the, um, I read an article, I think it was in The Guardian or somewhere like that about the study had come out and said, you know, that masking is akin to variolation, you know, that that it's the it can actually confer immunity to you. I didn't believe it just because I read it in The Guardian, which I trust. But even though uh, I read it in The Guardian, I thought, no, I'm going to back this up. So I traced it all the way back to the original study and I found the link that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that's a really important thing to do uh, to never you just can't believe everything you read. You have to trace it back to where it came from originally and, um, you know, check the check the credentials also of these scientists who are writing these articles. Um, so 
I guess that's it for my part. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to Tracy's part of the presentation. So we're going to take a look at the data and discuss current public opinion. Okay, so um, back in May to June, we, we decided to do um, this survey of people at the library. Um, we, we posted it on the library website just to kind of get an idea of, you know, were people wearing their face masks um, out in public, that sort of thing. And um, you can see that, like, at that point in time, we were in between. Um, we had just finished up our first initial Harris County mask mandate. So we were in between mask mandates at that point. And so um, basically people were like, a majority said that they always wore their mask in public. Um, a few were like, no, never. And then there were a few that are like, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Let's move on to the next one. So then we um, also asked about like what kind of mask you were wearing. Um, and at this point, it, I think it was still a little difficult to buy mass, mass produced masks because they were still out of stock and um, supplies hadn't been replenished. So you can see that like um, a lot of people, a few people were wearing mass produced ones, but the majority were wearing some sort of handmade fabric one that either they made themselves or that they um, purchased. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then just kind of asked about like if you if you actually purchased your mask, you know, what was most important thing to you? And um, you can see that like really like the the biggest deals were like the style of the mask, like is it pleated or is it fitted? That sort of thing was important. Um, cost um, as well as just availability, like, you know, can I get it to me anytime soon or is it back ordered for a month? Um, that sort of thing. And then a few people are like concerned about like fabric choices, you know, do I look cute in my mask? Um, Cause that's super important. Um, okay, go to the next slide. And then um, also asked about like, you know, hey, what was most important to you if you made your own mask? Um, so the majority of the people who answered our survey, they actually just purchased a mask, but um, a few people like actually were making their own masks. And you can see like um, a lot of people like actually researched different mask styles. So about 20% people did that um, or about 10% actually just made up their own pattern. Um, some use like the guidelines from the CDC. Um, Others tried a variety of different styles. That would be 17%. And that's kind of where I fell, um, where I just tried a bunch of different patterns till I found one that I liked. Okay, let's move on. Um, so a lot of confusion has happened over the changing mask guidelines. So, you know, some people are like, you know, hey, you told me that we didn't need a mask. So what up? Why why are we suddenly deciding that we need masks? And part of it is what Bronwyn has touched on and explained to us. And it's that the changing science that we're learning more about how the virus is spread and, and how uh, masks can protect us from um, those respiratory droplets. Um, but I went back and like did some research into just like the news headlines um, to figure out, you know, what was really going on. And as early as January 30th, when we only had five cases of the coronavirus in the U.S., people were already starting to hoard masks and other medical supplies. Um, pharmacies were completely sold out. Um, and what was interesting is this first article mentioned that um, someone who had worked through the 2009 H1N1 virus um, recalls being like they were completely out of N95s, like everybody had gone and purchased all of the N95s. Um, and during the um, Ebola outbreak of 2014, when a few cases turned up in the US, um, Tyvek suits were gone. So, um, like, you know, people have this history of, like, you know, if something comes up, they, they start freaking out and buying up all the supplies um, to protect themselves. Um, 
And it's it's not just in the U.S., it's across the world. And what I found was really funny is I found this one article um, about stockpiling in Germany. And um, in, in Germany, it's called, um, and my German is horrible, um, it's called Homster Coffee. And, and Bronwyn probably can pronounce it better than I can, but um, basically it's hamster buying. And it's akin to like how hamsters like will fill up their, their cheeks with like tons of food and just hoard it all in their cheeks. Um, so yeah. Um, so January 30th, like quarters are already starting to um, get all the masks. Um, I found this article in um, the beginning of March where now like people are like, they've gotten all the regular N95s and stuff and now they're hitting the hardware stores and grabbing up all of the um, masks that are made for people who are working in um, home repair kind of work. So for painting and dealing with dust and everything. And the super unfortunate thing about that is not, not only did it puts people at risk, the people, people who are working with chemicals and, and um, drywall dust and all that kind of stuff, um, it puts them at risk because they don't have the supplies that they need. But Typically, those types of masks are the ones with um, ventilation because um, they're just designed so that the workers don't breathe in particles. Um, they're not designed to keep the particles from or their respiration from coming back out. Um, so those masks are like completely useless for, you know, protecting for, for what we need them to do, which is to um, protect others from your own particles. Um, and what was interesting is like um, some people were like buying them to ship to family in China and Italy. So they were buying up all of our supplies and sending them, sending it to family in other countries that had been affected before us, uh, which kind of comes to bite you in the butt later on. Um, and then starting in also starting in March is when, you know, basically healthcare providers have been kind of been told, you know, hey, um, you know what, you're going to have to use like a bandana or a scarf or something because it, all the supplies are gone and we can't get you anymore. Um, and that's when like the DIYers started ramping things up and started making masks to actually give to healthcare workers. Um, so initially we were still at the point where like, you know, hey, healthcare workers really need these masks. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and then I found this really interesting article in April that um, referenced internal memos from the CDC to the White House um, where they were debating whether or not to recommend masks to the public. And some of the things that they were considering was um, the increasing evidence that pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic people were actually spreading the virus. Um, they were talking about how masks are not culturally acceptable in the US like they are in other countries um, where like wearing a mask in, in Asian countries is like con just considered good hygiene and common courtesy. Um, and they were also like trying to you know, make clear that the coverings that they're thinking about recommending are not the medical grade ones, but just, you know, general face coverings um, and also like what to call the face covering or the face mask. So they had um, contemplated calling it a courtesy mask or a universal source control. That sounds real fun to wear. Um, everybody put on your universal source control. Um, and another issue is that they were afraid that if they recommended wearing masks, that people would feel like it's safe to like go out and hang out with people all the time. Um, and then that whole social distancing thing would go away. So they're trying to balance, you know, do we tell people to social distance or do we tell people to wear a mask and go about doing their business? Um, and then they would like, become lulled into a false sense of security that, you know, hey, my mask is doing everything. Um, but ultimately, like, um, by the beginning of April, like, 
the CDC and and the White House decided it was important to like tell people to actually wear cloth masks. Um, and then towards the end of April, that's when like in the Houston area and other counties and cities across the country were um, starting to have mandatory mask orders, um, which they're like, hey, let's do this for 30 days, which was great. It kind of like flattened the curve a little bit, but we, as we saw, like, um, it wasn't enough because people then like, you know, hey, Memorial Day, let's go out and have fun. You know, the mask order's over. Um, and so now we have our new mask mandate that started um, in June and has just continued. And um, I think the thing, the key thing about the new mask mandate is that it put the onus on businesses and told businesses, hey, you need to require this. Um, Whereas previously it was like, you know, it was almost more of a recommendation than a requirement. All right, next slide. Um, the most important thing about wearing masks though is like wearing it correctly. Um, so I see so many people with the mask like slipping below their nose um, or they're just like comment, they're just like messing with the mask the whole time, like um, pulling on it or readjusting it. And, you know, every time you touch that mask, you're like, you know, getting germs all over it. Um, and then everything that you touch gets those germs. And um, really, it's best to like put that mask on and then don't touch it again unless you have to. And whenever you do wear your mask, you put it on without touching as much as you can. And then when you're done, you fold it up neatly and don't touch the inside because that's where all your germs are. Um, and just make sure that it fits snugly and um, against your face and that you can actually breathe and everything. Um, and don't wear one with an, a vent or exhaust valve. Um, and what you'll see, like, we're about to get into like the different masks that um, the three of us have designed and, and worn. And what I like to say is that the best mask is whatever fits you best. Um, and so we all have our own preferences. And, you know, as long as it fits and it doesn't fall down and it's comfortable to you and you're willing to wear it, that's the kind of mask you should wear. So, okay, next slide. Okay, let's go. If you're able to type your answer into the chat box, we have another question. When did you start wearing a face mask? So if you are currently wearing a mask or if you're just, if you're not wearing a mask because you don't leave your house, that's, let us know that. Uh, type that in the chat box too. We'd be interested in your answer. Okay, for the sake of time, moving on to our DIY masks portion. Um, and because we are running a little short on time, I'm going to go ahead and forward the slide and ask Bronwyn to take us away on her mask making adventure. Sure, thank you. Um, so I just want to preface by saying that I have a sewing machine, but I have very little experience with sewing. Um, so uh, I was still able to make um, a mask using this very simple pattern that I found. Um, I actually found this pattern on a website called the Qu uh, Crafty Quilter, um, but I didn't like her shape. I liked I liked the um, pattern and the uh, instructions that she provided, but I just didn't like the shape. So I changed the shape of of the pattern. Um, just no, this is the shape that I came up with that I like because um, it's a it's an Olsen style mask, so it's not pleated, um, but it fits it fits the face in such a way that it kind of hugs the nose and the chin, and it leaves a little space in, in the front of the nose and mouth, um, you know, so you're not, the mask isn't right up against your face. So I just, I like that. Um, so this is the pattern that I used, and I created a PDF of this as well with all the instructions, if anybody ever wants to try it. Um, and so next slide. And I only just used I only use this one pattern. That's that's all I ever did. So these are the um, some of the materials I use. I love the rotary cutter, um, my mat. Um, I have various types. I have some pinking shears. I think that's what those are called down at the bottom for trimming seams. 
Um, and fabric scissors, obviously. Now I use t-shirts, uh, old t-shirts to use as the ear straps. Um, and I just like, I just find it easier and I find them comfortable and they're easily adjustable when they start to stretch out um, and get too long. I just untie them and retie them to fit and then trim the edges and that's it. So that's how I do. Uh, Cause we had a hard time in the beginning finding elastic. It was in really short supply. Um, so that's just an alternative that I came up with and I stuck with it. Um, so um, I also use a nose wire uh, to go in the middle of the, you know, along the nose. And for that, I have this wire. I think it's florist wire. I don't know. It's just some wire that I found in my house. And I actually use washi tape um, to wrap around it. So I, I make it into like a little inch long um, piece of wire by wrapping wire, um, you know, by kind of twisting it back and forth to make like, you know, a little piece of wire that works well. And then I take washi tape and I wrap it all in washi tape. Um, and then um, at the end, when I, after I've made the mask, I make a little pocket in the top to fit that washi, uh, the little washi tape wire in. So that works well as well. It's just something that I came up with, uh, just using materials that I had in the house. And I've got my great sewing machine. I love these. These are, I, I bought it um, used off of, a, you know, a Facebook or something. I just love this machine. It's so good. Okay, next slide. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, just sh showing the steps. I, I do have two layers. Um, I also wanted to mention that I did read another study that showed it's sometimes really beneficial to use two different kinds of fabrics. Um, so like if you have cotton and flannel or you have cotton and chenille, I think is the fabric. But anyway, I just I saw some studies and I can't remember where I saw them that shown, showed that using two different types of fabric can be even more effective than just using one. And obviously you also wanna make sure that your thread count on your cotton is fairly thick. You don't want anything that's too thin. And one way of testing that is just taking the fabric and holding it up to a lamp. Um, and if, you know, testing the visit, if you can see a lot of light through that fabric, it's probably not great uh, thread count. So I use two uh, layers in my mask. You can see on the right-hand side, I've got the outer layer, which is longer than the inner layer. The inner layer is shorter to create a, a pocket for a filter. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so I sew a little, and I'm not, I don't know all these sewing terms, but I sew the edges of the inner mask, and then I take the two masks facing each other, and I sew them together around the top, along the top to get them, you know, get them together. And then after I've done that, I flip it over and I do, I think that's called a top stitch where you kind of like reinforce the stitch. Um, so I, it's sewn twice on the top. Um, so I do a top stitch edging along the, along the top of the mask there. And you can see that it's like got a little pocket there for the, for the filter and go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, and then I turn it back over, I sew it, and then after I've sewn the bottom, I turn it inside out. You've got to pull it inside out. And this on the right-hand side, you can see the mask has been turned inside out. Um, and so it's pretty much complete at this point. The only thing I need to do is sew, um, do the top stitching along the bottom side. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then once I've got the mask done, then that's where I, when I create the straps. Um, so I take my rotary cutter, an old t-shirt, and I just cut some strips from that t-shirt. Um, I cut them into like maybe eight inch strips, and then I just iron them into the uh, fold at the end of the mask. And then once I've got it all ironed in, I take it to my sewing machine and I just sew it right on there. And it's just super easy. So this is a finished mask at the at the right. Um, so you can see I've, I've got my t-shirt, I've you know, tied it around. I'd probably trim it a little bit more than that as well. Um, and then at this point as well, you can add the sleeve at the top of the nose to put that nose piece in there. Okay, and next slide. I think that might be it for me. Okay, great. Okay, so great. I'm gonna move rather quickly through my slides here. So materials, of course, you need 100% uh, cotton or quilting fabric. As you can see, I had stacks of fabric there. And I also have my Singer heavy duty sewing machine. And I do recommend if you are going to be making masks for friends, friends and family that you do use a sturdy sewing machine. 
um, especially if you are prone to sew over needles or wires. So next slide here shows some of my materials. Now, what you will notice on uh, the first picture is a package of blue automotive tiles. And you might be thinking, why do you need automotive tiles? Well, a study came out that was published in a few different uh, outlets, and I stumbled across it on uh, a Business Insider article. Uh, but a study came out saying that using these blue automotive towels as filters is almost as effective as the N95 masks. So if you're using your multiple layer cotton masks and you include these automotive towels as a filter, then you are, um, you're getting pretty good coverage. So you'll also see here the green wire. Now that is gardening wire. And that is the wire that I chose to use for the, the nose, the bridge of the nose to shape the mask. And I wanna, I, I, I wanna point out that having that wire is really important because if the mask isn't fitted to the contours of your nose, and if it does not fit snugly to your face, then um, you're allowing air to come in and possibly virus to come in. So I used garden wire. And if you looked um, on the picture here, you'll see at the very end, white bias tape. And so what I ended up doing was encasing all of my garden wire, once I cut it to size for the nose bridge, in the bias tape. And I would sew these little pockets to encase it. And that's what I used to cover the wire before sewing it into the actual mask itself. And I feel like it just provides added comfort around the bridge of your nose, and then it just keeps the wire secure. So here you'll also notice I used scissors and I had my rotary cutter. Um, if you're going to be making multiple masks, I highly recommend investing in a rotary cutter. It's uh, the most precise way to get exact cuts, especially with multiple layers of fabric and it just cuts your work time in half. And here you can see I have some black elastic. I know it looks like string, but it's actually jewelry elastic. So after going through thick, one fourth inch black elastic straps and then the one fourth inch white elastic straps and also using um, string, I decided to raid my jewelry making craft kit and try uh, jewelry making elastic. And that's what I ended up liking the most for the straps of my mask. So here you'll also need some wire cutters if you're using wire for the nose bridge and you'll need a cutting mat as you can see here. I do wanna point out if you are using pins to make your masks and piece your fabric together, you have to worry about the integrity of the fabric. So if you have those nifty culture clips or binder clips, something else, and you use that to keep your fabric together, that's a really great option. So you're not poking these holes into your fabric. So here, mask number one, and I ended up making four different styles of masks before kind of just freehanding my own pattern and style. But this first mask you see here, which I'm holding up, it is it has two layers of cotton without a filter pocket. So you can see here where I have the pattern on my cutting mat, and you would cut that pattern on, on the fold. So um, if you didn't want a center stitch, if you are okay with the center stitch on your mask, then you can cut it just in the middle or near the edge of a, of a piece of fabric and you can end up stitching the center part of your mask. Um, this mask, I really liked, it was comfortable, but this was the mask that I made in April. And then when I started reading um, more of the studies, I thought, oh, okay, so this mask is loose. I need something with the wire and I need something that has a filter pocket. So I quickly moved on from this one, even though I felt like it's comfortable, I now, dust my house in this mask. <laughs> so that's what I use for housework. Um, this mask pattern number two. So this is the mask that I adapted from that first pattern you just saw. And you can see the front, it lays out the same and there's wire on the nose bridge. But if you look at the inside view, you can see there that I created a little pocket with the inside um, piece of fabric. Um, and it's kind of hard to see there. So if you can see here, I created a little pocket to insert one of those blue automotive towel filters. So I didn't really, I made a lot of these and, and my family liked them, but I didn't really like the design of that pocket in the center. And honestly, it was time consuming to fold those in iron and top stitch. So I moved on from that pattern to another pattern, which my husband was kind enough to demonstrate here for us. 
So this pattern was recommended by um, a nurse practitioner, and I read I read a blog post she she wrote, and I watched her YouTube video, and she said she told DIY maskers if you're making masks for your um, your medical community, please consider making masks like this. So I like the design of this because it's easy to cut. I ended up using as my pattern an eight by ten uh, picture frame to to trace on my fabric and cut out. And you can see here in the center, there's a line and that's where it opens to insert the filter pocket. But I really like this style because it introduced me to um, to the strings that to the string tie that hangs around your neck. So you can see that the string I used, it's parachute cord and I loop it through the bottom and pull it out through the top so that when you take the mask off or untie it, it'll still hang around your neck. So you don't have to worry about putting it in your pocket. And if you see the front view here of the mask, you can tell that there is wire in that nose bridge. Um, so I don't have one to show right now, but you can see on the side picture where he is wearing the mask that the string, it pulls and you tie it in the back and you can adjust the fit of the mask. So for this one, I highly recommend this because if you are a novice sewer, um, it's, it's pretty easy to sew easier than the more uh, the fitted and curved masks. And it seems to be like um, a popular mask amongst uh, health professionals. Okay, moving on. I had to include this photo of my favorite mask that I've created to date, which is um, the mask with the purple and the gold and the stars. It's uh, symbolic of the National Women's Party. So I had to include that in a photo. And this is the current mask design that I, I'm probably sticking with. Um, it is tedious to make. It, it takes me a while to make these, but um, I want to show you here, if you can see on the camera, this is my lucky cat mask. And I'm using that same design as the square mask to tie my elastic. But this one has a filter pocket that's similar to Bronwyn's. So on the inside, you can, if you can see in there, you can fit your automotive towel or cotton for your filter. And this actually has three layers of fabric. So there's the layer of cotton for the filter pocket, and then there's two layers for the actual, the patterned fabric. So I feel like I have extra protection in this mask and I really like the shape of the mask. It fits over my nose well and it fits under my chin. And so I will end up including the links to the videos and patterns for creating um, this mask, my favorite mask, on the LibGuide that we will have live soon to accompany this program. Moving on, filters. I just wanted to show you a picture of the filters. Yes, I am. I like to create extra work for myself. So I could not just have folded automotive towel. I had to sew the automotive towel pieces together so they would be nice and neat and stick together. Um, I, wanna, I do wanna mention that if you are using automotive towels for filters and um, in your masks, that they can be washed up to three times on gentle cycle and, and still keep their integrity. After about three uh, washes, you probably need to replace it. Okay, and I just wanna point out that um, I've created a little mask zine. So it's a guide uh, with a lot of the information we discussed today, and it talks about how to care for your mask and how to wear your mask. And this will also be available as a PDF on our LibGuide for this program when it goes live. Okay, moving on, Tracy's Adventures in Mask Making. Sorry, forgot to mute my, unmute myself. Okay, next slide. I gotta try and go super fast since we're over time now. Um, so I start out with um, the more fitted style masks and I included where I found my patterns. And my very first mask, I couldn't find any elastic in my house. So I just used old shoelaces. Um, and and that, well, actually they weren't old shoelaces, they were like bonus shoelaces. Um, so that one worked out well. And then like Regina, I figured out, ooh, I have jewelry making supplies. So I um, got my jewelry elastic and started using that. Um, but what I didn't like about that mask is that um, 
it kept on sliding down my face, even with wire in the nose, it slides on me. So um, my next mask I tried was this one from Pretty Handy Girl and um, it didn't slide around as much, but what I did like is that it, um, it suggested using um, beads as adjusters on the elastic because my big issue is um, I was making masks for me, for my kids, for my husband who has like an exceptionally large head and then for my parents who I was not actually like visiting at the time but wanted to be able to deliver masks. So it's like, how do I make it adjustable so that it'll fit anyone? Um, I didn't have any beads. So I used the little jump rings and, and that worked out fine. Um, but I still didn't really like the mask design. And you can see, I also um, included a wire sleeve so that um, you could just basically put in whatever wire and change it out if you didn't like the wire that I gave you. Okay, next slide. Oh, and one of the reasons why I didn't like that second mask was that it was just super hard to make. Um, the front piece of fabric was bigger than the back piece of fabric and he had to like fold it over and, and it was just like, it was a mess. Um, so then I switched to the pleated style and um, what I like about them is they're super easy to make. And I started with three pleats because that's just what my sister-in-law had like shown me how to do. And like, I was finding that it was jamming up too much on my sewing machine. So then I just moved to like um, two pleats and and that was so much better. And you can see I like one of them I did like just sewn in elastic and then another one I tried doing the adjuster thing. And then Facebook went and suggested this mask that I found online that has these really cool like adjuster thingies. Um, and I was like, hmm, I wonder how I can make that at home because the masks themselves are like, 20 bucks a piece. And I'm sorry, if I have to buy masks for, you know, like several for me and for my husband and for my two kids, I cannot afford a $20 mask. Um, so I figured out like, basically it's um, the piece of fabric goes into a little loop at the bottom of the mask. And then, you know, you can like tighten it and loosen it. And so what I did was I used elastic and made a little loop at the bottom of my mask and then just had a big loop of elastic that goes through that little tiny loop. And I just like hand sewed to tighten up the tiny loop um, just enough so that the elastic will get tension um, so that you can like make it tighter or looser depending upon how big your head is. Um, the thing that I like about the pleated masks is like I said, I am like doing masks for multiple members of my family and um, not everybody has the same head size. Not everybody has the same face size. And so I can just make a bunch of these and it fits everyone. I have them in a bag hanging next to the back door. And basically when you leave the house, you grab one of those. It doesn't matter which one because they fit everybody. And then when you get back home, there's a lingerie bag hanging in the laundry room and you stick your mask into that lingerie bag and I wash it whenever I do a load of laundry. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I found some new supplies that I haven't tried out yet. Um, so the kind of elastic I like to use is like it's a super soft ground elastic that's very similar to like the surgical masks that you can buy um, mass made. Um, and so I found some black that does a better job of matching my dark fabrics. And then I found these um, silicone toggles so that you can use those as adjusters. Um, and then I also found these um, stainless steel nose thingies because um, I've just been using some jewelry wire in, in my nose pieces. Um, so I haven't had a chance to try all of my supplies out yet. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of anxious to try them out and see what I think. Although Regina told me she tried out the um, stainless steel nose things and did not like them. So we'll see how that goes, but um, eventually I'm gonna give that a try. Okay, move on. Okay, so we have one more question. If you can type your answer in the chat box and thank you for sticking with us. On a scale of one to five, how likely are you to try one of the mask patterns from today's presentation? So one is not likely, five is very likely. 
And if you can just type your answer in the chat box, we appreciate it. And now we're moving on to just a couple of recommendations. I wanted to, um, or Bronwyn wanted to recommend Pale Horse, Pale Rider, and I'm gonna let her talk about that. Yeah, it's just, I, I really love Catherine Ann Porter. If he, if nobody's ever read her, she's amazing. And she, it's just a short, uh, this is a collection of short stories. And one of them is called, one of them is about uh, the uh, 1918 uh, influenza pandemic. So just wanted to mention that. So she's a great writer. Cool, okay. So I wanted to, of course, recommend John Barry's The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. Um, even if you aren't a science buff or a history buff, I think this this book will fascinate you. It uh, um, it delves into the epidemiology, the science of the virus, the spread of the virus. But um, John Barry, in most of his interviews, you will hear him say that he re what he really had in mind when he was writing this book was um, power in in government and how administrations use their power uh, to get use or do not use their power to get a country through a pandemic or a national crisis. So I highly recommend this. It'll be linked to in our catalog. We do have audio, digital, and physical copies for you. And, um, oops, just did that thing again where I click on the link. Okay, so now um, one more question. Sorry, did you learn something new from today's presentation? Type yes or no in the chat box. Thank you so much for doing that. And now I do want to recommend that later when this is live on the LibGuide, you go back and you watch this video. During my research um, in one of the National Archives, I found an old uh, public service announcement video created by a doctor and some scientists to alert people of the dangers of, the inf of influenza and why it's so important to wear masks. And I think it's interesting if you look at this, the the initial frame here that you see one of the nurses is wearing a mask tied and there's kind of there's gaps on the side and the other one is wearing that gator style um face covering and neither of those are very effective because how they fit the face and how they're wearing them so i think it's interesting looking at this but i it's about 18 minutes long go back and watch it it's fascinating and of course when i found this um cool video i thought you know what we have to throw together our own cool PSA video. So if you will just hang with us for a few more minutes and watch the premiere of our very own PSA video for masks, I would appreciate it. I'm gonna go ahead and press play and hope this works. If you can't hear it, you can hear it later when it's live on the guide. Thank you so much for hanging around and watching our uh, the premiere of our public service announcement. And that is officially the end of our presentation. So thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. I have learned several new ways to wear masks and what to do and what not to do. 
And the use of automotive towels is really interesting. I had heard vacuum cleaner filters, but you have to make sure that they don't have any fiberglass in them. Um, appreciate you guys sticking with us for the extra couple of minutes. And it's been awesome are, to have you guys. Are there any lingering questions that anyone has? And we will be posting the slides from today that have the links and the PDF copies of the patterns for you guys if you want to make your own masks. I know I've given it a couple of tries, but I'm willing to try something new. There are also lots of places that are carrying buy your own masks right now, whether you make or whether you buy. Mask up and stay safe. All right, we will see you guys next week for a Chinese cooking demonstration with our library assistant, Casey, who's going to show us some popular Chinese food dishes and how to make them. So I'm really excited about that because y'all know me, I love food. All right, thank you so much you. and see you around.